We're joined by the Minister of Health and Social Services, Mark Drakeford, to talk about prudent healthcare and what that means for the NHS. Uh, Minister, can you tell me what you mean by the term prudent healthcare? Well, I think prudent healthcare is a way of thinking about what we do in the NHS in Wales. And I think it's a way of approaching services that draws together, relying on the best evidence that we have for what we do, makes maximum use of clinical judgment and clinical prioritisation in making sure that those people whose need is most urgent are always at the front of the queue. And then thirdly, I think it makes us think about finances as well, always looking to make sure that we extract the maximum value for the investment we're able to make in terms of outcomes for patients. Okay. Now, if you're a patient, often you measure your um, satisfaction or your thoughts on the NHS with how much they're doing for you. You, you often think, well, the doctor's tried this, the hospital's tried that. How does that equate with the principles of prudent healthcare? Won't people think, oh, you're just rationing care? Well, there are some challenges in prudent healthcare for patients as well as for the service. And we do in some ways have to restructure the conversation that we have between the people who provide the service and the people who use it. Um, despite the huge merits that the NHS has, one of the things which I think you can um, level some criticism at the way the health service was established is, is that it does rather rely on a relationship in which all the power is on one side of the table and all the need is on the other. And that sort of does encourage people to come through the door thinking that they are able to hand over what is happening in their lives to somebody else who will then somehow solve the problem for them. And prudent healthcare, along with co-production, is very much a way of evening up that conversation, of recognising the expertise that people have in their own lives, while at the same time saying to patients that there are things which they will need to contribute if the outcomes are to be best for them. And sometimes measuring what the NHS does for you by volume is not necessarily the best way of seeing whether it's doing the right thing for you. I think there's a lot we can learn from social care and the reablement movement in all of this. Part of prudent healthcare has to be that we are always asking ourselves the question, what are we doing alongside this person to maximise their own ability to go on leading a life in which they have the maximum control over their own needs and circumstances and that is a different way about of thinking about things okay so to take an example for uh, recently there's been perhaps criticism that the nhs isn't doing as much for for example bariatric patients as perhaps they might do so rather than a patient uh, thinking I, I need an operation to um, to address this condition. What might happen in, the, in, in an instance of how prudent healthcare might be applied? Well, in a prudent uh, healthcare approach, we'd be asking ourselves two or three key questions here. First of all, we would need to be sure that whatever we were offering that patient was based on the most tried and tested methods, that it is evidence-based, that we are sure that we are not going on doing things where we know the evidence tells us that those things either do no good or worse still might be doing active harm in that person's life and there still is ground to be gained in the health service in making sure that we eliminate from our repertoire those things that don't do good and may do harm so that's the first question we'll be asking ourselves the second question we'll be asking ourselves is what is the minimum necessary intervention that we need to pursue with this person to produce the results that we are jointly trying to produce. And that minimum necessary intervention will rely on thinking about what the person is able to contribute as well as what the health service is able to contribute. And we should never do more than we need to do. Put it the other way around, you, you'd never want to be having a more invasive form of treatment than your condition requires. So the minimum necessary principle makes a virtue of that very important uh, point. Of course, that does not mean that when you have exhausted the first level of intervention and found that there's more that you need to do, that you won't move to that next level. And it doesn't mean in the bariatric surgery example that there won't be people who require 
the most invasive forms of treatment. But we go to those at the end of the process, as the last point in the process, and quite certainly not the first. We only move up the hierarchy of interventions when we're confident that we've exhausted the things that lie below them. Okay, and if you were a member of um, the NHS workforce, how would you apply the principles of prudent healthcare in your day-to-day -day work? What sorts of things should you be looking for? How would you contribute? How could you be a part of the bigger picture? Well, I think if you're someone who's part of the workforce, then the way the prudent healthcare principles will apply most vividly in your work is by looking at process innovation. Very often, the way we provide services and the way we do things don't match up easily to the principles that I've just outlined. So we're going to have four workshops here in Wales looking at four different examples. And what we're going to be saying is, if you were running pain management services, for example, along the lines that we have just discussed, what would that service look like? How would we be redesigning the service that we provide? And we've got some very good examples in Wales where that's already been done. If you think of our lymphedema services, for example, we are now treating more people, more quickly, more effectively, and without needing extra resource to do it than we were not that long ago. And that's been brought about by a very committed group of people using prudent healthcare principles to redesign the service that is provided, making sure that we don't do things that were ineffective, making sure that we do things that really make a difference, making sure that we start with the basic tried and tested forms of intervention before we move on to anything more intrusive or invasive. If you're working in an area and are asking yourself these questions, then I think quite soon people will see ways in which the service they provide can be adapted to the way we will need to do things in the future. Yeah, that's right, because it's a challenge for staff, isn't it, to explain that to patients, especially when uh -huh. traditionally they've measured their care on the volume of activity they provided. Absolutely. It certainly relies on those uh, conversations. But when you have the conversations and you're able to explain to people that this is so that we can put the resources that the NHS has, and I don't mean just money, although money is very important to it, but resources in terms of staff time and expertise, that we are matching our resources to greatest need, that we are doing the things that are most likely to work, that we are doing them in partnership with patients so that their contribution to their own better health and well-being is maximised, then I think it's a conversation which very quickly makes sense to people who use the service as well as those who provide it. And if you're a member of the department here at Welsh Government, how would you apply principles of prudent healthcare in your day-to-day -day work here? Well, here we tend to be looking at strategies uh, for the future. We tend to be looking at the way that we deploy the funding that we've got available. And it's exactly the same thing, really. It's when we're looking at the way we want to develop things in the future that we apply exactly those same principles here in the way that we try and set out those uh, rather sort of larger and overarching ways of doing things so that for the person on the ground there is a clear and obvious connection between the things we say as a government that we want to see happening and the job that we ask them to do. Mark Rayford, thank you very much. Thank you.